So inverse functions, again, we saw these come up in our trigonometry class, but we want to make sure we can still apply it to our just kind of basic functions as well. Um, so inverse functions, they switch our input and output values. So that changes the form of our function. And this is where to represent an inverse function. So if our original function is f of a is equal to b, so a is the input, b is the output, we're switching it so that a is the output, b is the input. What we do is we take that original function name, so that function f, and we put a little negative 1 there that just reads as inverse. And it is not an exponent. In fact, let me try to write that in big red letters, because that's a very common mistake with these. It is not an exponent. Let's get some exclamation marks in there. <laughs> All it is is notation. It's just to say that we're <clears throat> taking the inverse of the function f. A way to check your inverse functions is using composite functions. So if you take f of the inverse function of x, it's like there's this cancellation that happens, so you're just left with your variable. And same thing when you flip it around, you're just left with your variable when you layer them together. Um, Let's see, the next C, so switching input and output values, which means if you're working with graphs, the graph comes through as a reflection over y equals x. That can be pretty hard to visualize. Instead, what you could just think of is if you have your original function f of x, you're just switching your coordinates. You're just switching the x and y coordinates. So you take all of your original coordinates, switch them, and then you graph those new coordinates. So for example, real quick, if your original function f of x had the point, let's say, 1, 2, 3, 2. If that was on your original function, so that's 3, 2, then your inverse function would have the coordinate 2, 3. So we just go 1, 2, 3, and that would be a coordinate for inverse f of x. So you just do that for all of your coordinates, and that would make your inverse graph. But let's look at algebraically. So what we're going to do is switch our input and output values and solve. So, and these will be a bit complicated, but we want to see those tricky cases um, together. So, with this one, we are going to take the inverse of this function, x squared over x squared minus 2. So where we could think of that as y equals that expression over there, what we're going to do is switch it and say x equals y squared over y squared minus 2. And then what we want to do here is solve for y. So I would multiply both sides by y squared minus 2. So that would give me x times y squared minus 2 is equal to y squared. I'm going to go ahead and distribute, so x times y squared minus 2x is equal to y squared. Then what I'm going to do is get everything with y on one side of the equation, so I'm going to subtract xy squared from both sides. So I'm going to have y squared minus xy squared. I'm going to go ahead and factor out a y squared, so negative 2x is equal to y squared times 1 minus x. And this is setting me up so I have, can have y all alone on one side of the equation. So I'm going to divide both sides by 1 over x. I'm going to go ahead and move up here. So I'll have y squared is equal to negative 2x over 1 minus x. And then I just take the square root of both sides, which when we're solving, that's going to lead us to plus or minus. And then just this whole square root negative 2x, 1 over x. It isn't pretty, but it's the setup that we want to describe this um, output value over here, given an input. Basically, we just don't want to be able to see y anywhere over here. It should just be in terms of x. Now, what we ended up with here are actually two equations. We have this positive negative 2x over 1 minus x. And we have this negative root, negative 2x over 1 minus x. So if I was doing input and output, and I wanted to plug in a value, let's say x equals 2. 
If I wanted to plug in x equals 2, I would have to do it to both of these equations to get out y. And that right there is not a property of functions. Remember with functions, for every input, there's exactly one output. So we ended up with equations for two different outputs to be calculated. So something that we're seeing here is that this is not a function. Or you could say this is not invertible. Actually, I wouldn't say it here. What we're getting at the end here is not a function. What I would say is that f of x, that original function, is not invertible. And how this comes through is you can see it quickly from the graph and using the horizontal line test, which we talked about a bit in our class back when we looked at the inverse functions. Um, so let's look at the graph. So x squared over x squared minus t. So this is our function f of x, and this is a function because it passes the vertical line test. So for every vertical line that we draw, we only cross one time. Now when we take the inverse function, we're flipping all of our x and y values. So that's where we want to see that if we flip this, is it going to still be a function? Do we still pass that vertical line test with the inverse function? But instead of creating a whole graph for the inverse function, what we want to do is be able to evaluate it right here. So how it comes through is the horizontal line test is that we should be able to draw a horizontal line, let's say it like y, um, oh sorry, y equals 4. If we draw a horizontal line somewhere, we should only be crossing one time. But as we can see here, we have two times. So again, this is our original function f of x, but if you imagine with the inverse function, we'd be flipping our x and y values. So it's like if we had x equals 4, we'd have these two possibilities, and it'd be that negative and positive values um, coming from those two equations that we just found. And that doesn't work for functions. So with that, after like we can do the work to solve, but the fact that we end up with two equations means I don't want to use this function notation because this is not a function. We are able to calculate the inverse, but it's actually not invertible in terms of functions. All right, so let's look at g of x. And actually, let's go ahead and look at the graph. And what we can do is check to make sure it's invertible before we go through all the work of finding an inverse for it. So let's see, squared of x, which here, we're passing that horizontal line test. For every horizontal line I can draw, um, we're only going to cross one time. Even out here where it looks really flat, we're only crossing one time. So with that, g of x is invertible. So I know this work won't be wasted once we go through this. So I'm going to set it up as x equals 1 over root y. So I'm just flipping the notation, and then what I want to do is solve for y. So I'm going to multiply both sides by the square root of y. So I'll have x times square root of y equals 1. I'm going to divide by x. And then I'm going to square both sides so I can get rid of that square root. So y equals, and that'll be a 1 over x squared. That right there is our inverse function, is 1 over x squared. So there's our inverse functions.